Adrienne Clarke is uh, one of Australia's uh, most renowned geneticists. She specialised in uh, the genetic engineering of plants, um, and particularly creating plants resistant to insect attack and fungal diseases. A simple scientist with a deep intellect who has transformed her career into many other places as well. Um, in her scientific career, she's become a fellow of the Australian Academy of Science, the Australian Academy of Technical Sciences and Engineering, and also the National Academy of Sciences um, in the USA as a foreign member. She then rose to become the chairman of CSIRO, the Commonwealth Serum, uh, sorry, Common, <laughs> Commonwealth Science <laughs> Industrial <laughs> Research Organisation, <laughs> which was a fascinating organisation created more than, what, 60 years ago, mm -hmm. when research was pretty much in the environs of uh, the government and universities and how much change there has been in the field of research in that 60 years or so is just amazing and uh, clearly Adrian has been a key player in Australia in that transformation. But she's also um, joined a number of boards in the commercial world, so um, is, uh, has been or is on the board of Alcoa, Woolworths, Western Mining Corporation, Fisher and Paykel Healthcare, and uh, Hexima, which is an organisation she may talk about uh, in due course. It's interesting when, when you think that uh, she has now become the Chancellor of La Trobe University and so is playing at a much greater macro level in the guidance of our, of our education system. So I'm very interested to see how a plant geneticist and a university chancellor reflects on education in this world. And I thank Adrian particularly for living in Carlton, but coming back from Rajasthan in India, particularly for this. Oh, <laughs> it's the long way around. <laughs> well, thank Adrian. You, thank you, Peter. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here. And I really can't say very much about primary school education, although I do see the grandchildren. And I must say that I think the school's quite innovative. I asked, that before I get onto my real thing, so I asked the little six-year-old what what was she? What was her favourite topic today? She said, "I liked philosophy best." I said, "Oh, <laughs> what, what did you do in philosophy?" Oh, she said, "We talked about what was right and what was wrong." I said, "Oh, good." The next day, I asked her what she what what had she done. She said, "We studied biodiversity." I said, "Really? <laughs> I said, what did you do?" She said, "We planted carrots and peas, and we're watching and measuring how they're growing." and how they respond to light. <laughs> so <laughs> I have to say that they're, they're quite innovative, uh, but I have a very limited uh, experience <laughs> there. I have a much, more, um, a much broader experience at teaching right at the high level, the uh, graduate students, uh, both at Melbourne University and other universities, and I think they're amazingly innovative. But what I thought I'd do today is explain the story of an innovation that I was involved with and um, bring out some of the essential features of innovation and creativity in this context. Now, I've just looked at the list of people. I know I'm not talking... I'm talking mainly to non-scientists. So the few scientists, please... please accept my apologies for being very simplistic. This was a story... Um, uh, it was the girl science, actually. It was myself and Professor Marilyn Anderson, who's now at La Trobe University, Dr Robin Heath and Angela Atkinson. And we were studying um, how plants discriminate, how, how a female of a plant decides what sort of pollen she'll accept. Now, I'm just going to explain this very briefly. I brought my props here. Uh, we weren't really working on lilies, but it's got, it's got nice big sexual parts so I could explain it to you. Okay, so here are the petals. So if you pull the petals off, then you um, expose the sexual parts, so the anthers. These are the male bits. They've got the pollen. The pollen's got the sperm cells. So if you emasculate this plant... <laughs> there it goes. <laughs> You're left with the female part. Okay, so we were studying... <laughs> How this is the female part, that's its stigma, and that's where the pollen's received. And the pollen normally then grows a tube and it grows all the way down this style, down here to the ovary, 
which is where the seed is set. Now, we were studying this, not, not in lilies, but I'm just showing this because lilies are nice and big. Um, we were studying it because we wanted to understand how did the female know which pollen to accept. And it's quite clever. It won't accept its, in most plants, it won't accept its own pollen. It will only accept pollen closely related but different genetically. So our question was, how do we do that? So to try and... I mean, it's, it's a very fundamental question in biology because you can imagine that if plants were allowed to um, fertilise themselves, it would be like having an incestuous mating all the time and they wouldn't have survived. So it's a very fundamental question in evolution. But I'm not going to talk about that so much, is to say what we tried to do was get a landscape of information we were exploring. We said, OK, what are all the molecules in this, in this sticky stuff here on the, on, the, on the female? So the female's nice and sticky, all ready to receive the pollen. So we started to analyse it. And to our surprise, we came up with just two molecules which really dominated, two proteins that really dominated. We said, wow, why is it so? Why would the female be making all this stuff, putting all its energy into making these two particular molecules. Hmm, why is it so? So we used the technology of the day, uh, which is to isolate those molecules, sequence them, so get the protein sequence, and put the sequence into the data banks, and also isolated the appropriate genes and put that, those molecules into the data banks. What came back... They said, wow, this is, one is a protein, well, I won't explain too much, but one is a, a molecule to do with digestion in, in insects and people, and the other is a molecule to do with defending against various things. How oh, I said, now why would the female be doing that? So we sat, I can remember we sat, Marilyn Anderson uh, and Robin and I sat, and we pointed on this, we said, well, isn't this interesting? You know, in, the, in the field, you know, in the garden, if you ever look at your plants, you never see the female being attacked by insects or being uh, overrun by fungi or bacteria. It's always pristine. Uh, and we put these two bits of knowledge together and we thought, hmm, perhaps these molecules are there to protect the female from being attacked by insects and being attacked by fungi and bacteria because her main role is one, get the best sperm, and two, protect her eggs. So she has to have all the protective molecules around her. Huh, we said, well, okay, there's a hypothesis. So the next thing you do is test it. So we said, all right, here's our hypothesis. The hypothesis is that these molecules that are present here right on the surface of this really sticky, sweet um, stigma that you would think would be d delicious for insects and would be just the right thing for fungi, it's to protect them. How will we test it? So what we did was we, we took a, a flower, not a lily, but we were working with a, a, a tobacco flower, and we just put some fungi on it. And what happened was that all the, the petals just drooped and became brown, and the anthers didn't do too well, but the stigma, even although we really layered it with a lot of fungi, stayed there pristine. So that was a really good start. So then what we did was isolate the molecules and then we tested them against various different fungi. And they killed certain fungi at certain concentrations and they didn't kill others. So then we refined our hypothesis and said, OK, it looks as though they are only attacking <coughs> the fungi that grow in filaments, that grow in long tubes, that grow from, a, uh, grow from a point. So then we tested that hypothesis and then we refined it and then we said, um, OK, if we can isolate this and we can transfer that gene to another plant, will it become resistant to fungi? So we did that. It, by genetic engineering, we put it into another plant and then you test it by putting d various fungi on it and, yes, the plant was resistant. And so then the rest is history. 